These are the last two topics in chapter four. So we're going to talk about gravimetric and combustion analysis in this lecture. Gravimetric analysis is just analyzing something as some sort of substance by changing its state so that you can actually separate the components that make it up. You'll then measure the masses of those components and then from that you can get information about the uh, makeup of that substance. So an example would be, um, say in lab, which is actually what you'll be doing for one of the labs next year, you'll have a compound like copper sulfate. Copper sulfate is a salt that is usually associated with molecules of water. So the most common form of copper sulfate has five water molecules that are associated with it. And it's this sort of really lovely blue color. However, you can gently heat copper sulfate and drive off those water molecules. And when you do that, you get anhydrous copper sulfate, which is copper sulfate minus the water. This is a type of gravimetric analysis. Essentially, you can drive off the water from copper sulfate, um, find out the mass of water that was lost, and then you can find out the percent of water in copper sulfate. So here's an example of a gravimetric analysis word problem. We have a mixture that's given to us with its mass in grams, and we're told that the mixture contains a certain amount of magnesium sulfate. The mixture is dissolved in water and it's reacted with barium nitrate. You're told one of the products is actually a precipitate and it is barium sulfate and its mass is given to you. The first thing you need to do or you're asked to do is to write the chemical equation and then you're asked what's the mass percent of magnesium sulfate in this mixture. So you're going to write the chemical equation here. Um, the two reactants are given to you. One of the products is given to you and you need to write down the second product. So you should recognize these as ionic compounds and in this reaction it's going to be an exchange reaction so they switch partners. Once you have the coefficients correct, I'm sorry, once you have the subscript, subscripts correct, you're going to make sure that the entire equation is balanced by adjusting coefficients if you need to. Okay, so that would be the first step. Now the question is asking what is the mass percent of magnesium sulfate in the mixture. So a mass percent is going to be the grams of the substance you're interested in, which is going to be the magnesium sulfate, divided by the total mass of the mixture. So you're trying to find out the grams of magnesium sulfate here. You're given the total mass of the mixture in that first line. The next thing you have to look at is you're actually given grams of barium um, sulfate which is uh, the product in this reaction. And you need to ask, what is its molar relationship to magnesium sulfate? So if you look at the chemical equation, which is balanced, you should see it is one to one. Meaning, however many moles you have of the barium sulfate, you will have an equal number of moles of magnesium sulfate. Okay, so let's start with the grams of barium sulfate that are given to us. You need to convert that to moles because this entire because all chemical equations are written uh, in terms of moles and a molar relationship. Okay, um, so you're going to convert that to moles. You get this number of moles of the barium sulfate. You're told, according to the equation, that this number of moles of barium sulfate is equivalent to the number of moles of magnesium sulfate. So now you have these moles of magnesium sulfate. You then need to convert this to grams. So you're going to multiply that by its molar mass and you're going to get this number of grams of magnesium sulfate. The last step is you want to figure out a mass percent. Mass percent is going to be the compound of interest on top divided by the total mass of the compound itself times 100 and you get a number of 69.91% um, mass percent of magnesium sulfate in this, com in this unknown mixture.
Here's another word problem. It's very similar to the previous one. You have a sample of potassium chloride that's dissolved in water and treated with silver nitrate. You're told the mass of the product, silver chloride, that is produced, and it's asking you to calculate the percentage of KCl in the original sample. So you're going to need the chemical equation, and it does tell you some of the reactants. You know that there's potassium chloride in there, so that's KCl. You know that it's going to have also silver nitrate in there. So those are going to be your two reactants that you're concerned with. And then you're told what the product is. So AgCl is insoluble, which is why it has an S after it, and your second product is going to be the salt. So KNO3. You're going to check this equation to make sure it's balanced, and it is. And then you're going to start with one of the two pieces of, of information. You're given the mass of the AgCl, AgCl, which is the product. So you're going to start there. You're going to get moles of the AgCl. After you get the moles of the silver chloride, you're going to look at its molar relationship to KCl. According to the equation, it's actually one to one. So what, however many moles you have of silver chloride, you're going to, ha to have an equal number of moles of KCl. Right? So there are your equivalent moles of KCl. You need to convert this to grams in order to finally get a percentage. Okay, so you're going to multiply it by the molar mass and get the grams of KCl. You're then going to divide that by the total mass multiply by 100 and you should get 97.11% of KCl is in this impure compound. Here's an example you should try on your own. So it's very similar to the previous ones and you're only asked to find one thing. Um, and then you're asked to find the mass percent of chloride in the sample given. So I'm going to pause this for a few seconds and then hopefully you should get this answer. So moving on to combustion analysis. Combustion analysis is actually a type of gravimetric analysis. It's again using the masses of certain compounds to find out its composition. In the case of combustion analysis, a substance is actually burned as shown below and the gases that are released are collected and weighed. Here is an example of combustion analysis. You're told that polyethylene is composed of carbon and hydrogen atoms. Here's another example for a combustion analysis. You have a sample that is made up only of carbons and hydrogens. Upon combustion or upon being burned, it produces this number of grams of carbon dioxide and this number of grams of water. And you're asked, what is the empirical formula for this polymer? So you're going to approach it the same way as you did the other one you have grams of carbon dioxide, and you're trying to find out how many carbons there are in this polymer. So you're going to take the grams of carbon dioxide, you're going to find the moles. You're then going to use the stoichiometric relationship between carbons in the carbon dioxide to uh, set up this equation. The way this is set up now, the moles of carbon dioxide cancel each other out, and you have moles of carbon left. And that will now give you, finally, the moles of carbon. I'm going to do the same thing with the grams of water. Convert it into moles, so you have moles of H2O. Use the stoichiometric factor between how many moles of hydrogen there are in one mole of water. And there are two moles of hydrogen for every mole of water. You're then going to get, the, finally, the moles of hydrogen. To find the empirical formula, you need to divide by the smaller number. So you're going to be dividing by 1.65 times 10 to the negative 4. If you do that for carbon, you get one carbon. When you do that for hydrogen, though, you get an odd number. You get a number of 
So you know you have to multiply that by something. So you can start multiplying. If you multiply 1.67 times 2, though, you get 3.34, which is not any better. It's not 3 and it's not 4. You can't round that off. So instead of multiplying by 2, try the next number, which would be 3. If you multiply 1.67 times 3, you actually get 5.01, which you can safely round off to 5. So that tells you that there are 5 hydrogens. But because you multiplied this uh, initial number for hydrogen by 3, you must also multiply the number of carbons by 3. So you had one carbon from above. You're going to multiply that by 3. So now you have C3. And for the hydrogens, you knew you have 5. So your empirical formula is C3H5. So please try this example on your own. Uh, it's very similar to the previous two examples. The only difference here is you're asked to find the empirical formula for a compound that is made up of nitrogen and hydrogen instead of carbon and hydrogen. But the, for, uh, the steps are the same. The approach, the methodology is the same. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to write down these values and to set it up. And uh, hopefully you'll get this answer. If you do not get this answer, or if you're stuck, email me. We can set up a remote meeting, or you can just email me your question, and I will answer. Uh, so just let me know if you have any problems with this.